I don't have a parenting, like, favorite parenting book or, like, methodology or anything like that. I just have influences in my life, I guess, from when I was born to now. And that's how I've sort of, sort of curated from those influences on how I want to parent. And the three, three biggest influences that I see every single day are uh, my, my parents, the way they raised me, and, and, and mostly just the immense amount of love they gave me and the fact that I always felt love. That was huge, 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 huge. And not just my parents, my whole family, my sister, my, my aunts and uncles, my cousins, everyone. It was a very loving tribe. And then the second biggest influence is, or not, these aren't in any particular order, but uh, is, is CrossFit. And what I've learned from CrossFit in the last 14 years. And basically, the, it's taught me how humans move, how humans should eat optimally, and how I can teach other people that, how I can incorporate that into it being a lifestyle. And that's just basically taking my L1. The L1 just blew my brain. And then the third thing is my wife... Um, giving me a a uh, crash course, a twenty some odd year crash course in in mindfulness, and what mindfulness um, is basically uh, tantamount to um, meditating or self awareness, but it's basically just always being aware on some level. It's basically just taking responsibility for your thoughts and your actions at all times. At all times, 24 hours a day, sleeping, waking, but having some some awareness. And the more you practice that, what people call meditation, which you should be doing 24 hours a day, the more you cultivate, the stronger it gets. And, the least, and, and, and you're more able to make the right decision, which often is to do nothing, no thing. But that, all that being said, I'm going to give you these 10, these 10 items that if you, if you need that, that 10, those 10 items, a list of things to work on as a parent or things you want to sort of incorporate that you think that I incorporate, that you want to work on, I'm going to give them to you. Number one, always get up before your kids. If your kids get up before you, you will be playing catch up the rest of the day. Universal law. I didn't make it. It's just the way it works. I have two three-year-olds and a five-year-old. If by fucking the sh- hand of God, the stroke of maybe it's Satan, they get up before me, I'm screwed. They are like chirping birds. Little kids are so demanding and they will drive you crazy. Get up before them, an hour before them at least, and get, get, your, get your game face on. Be ready at all times. Have whatever you left the mess out the night before cleaned up. Just be ready. When they get up, the storm is on hurricane family in effect so good parent great parent if you want to be a great parent you get up before your kids number one number two if you fight in front of your kids then you need to make up in front of your kids even if you're faking it your kids are influenced by you so if you uh leave the refrigerator door open or your wife leaves the refrigerator door open and you say to her jesus christ lady that's the fifth time i told you to close that refrigerator door you know that's no way to talk to her there's no way to talk to anybody and you need to apologize to her and your kids need to see that you need to take a few deep breaths and be like hey honey that was totally inappropriate i'm sorry i should have been calmer it's no big deal the refrigerator doors open what i meant to say is is like hey we're wasting electricity can we try to close this and and move on it's it's you do not want to teach your kids to be a rude asshole and you do not want to teach your kids to leave um leave things open-ended open-ended fights and all that crap that sucks no one wants to be a part of that don't teach your kid how to do that and we'll get into this as we go further and further but there's no homeostasis around kids you are either teaching them something great or you are teaching them something horrible there's no oh that's just is what it is there's no middle ground they're always learning the good or the bad now don't be an idiot you come home from work and your brother's railing your wife and you take a lamp and you break it over your wife's head, then, then you don't, you don't, and your kids are home and you've completely lost your shit, then you need to speak to someone like, 
like Tony Plower, like a, a, a fight psychologist or something, to figure out how to unfuck yourself. You do not try to make that shit up in front of your kids. You know what I'm saying? I'm just talking about normal stuff. Normal, normal stuff that you, idiosyncratic shit you have that you might get mad at your wife or your husband about. Don't fight in front of your kids, and if you do, teach them the lesson of what making up and being humble is all about. Number three, don't hit your kids or don't yell at your kids. One, it's not effective at all. But two, and the most important reason, and it's not because hitting is bad or yelling is bad, is because you are teaching your kids that you are out of control. You are teaching your kids that being out of control is an option for a situation. Being out of control is the ugliest characteristic in the world. And when you see your kids out of control, it's nauseating. Don't do it. Don't teach them how to do it. Don't yell. If you are really, really pissed because you've told your kid three times to stop throwing fruit at the dinner table, take three deep breaths, pick your child up, carry them as lovingly and as gently as you can, set them down on their bed and shut the door. And tell them you'll be back in 10 minutes. That's it. That's as aggressive as you need to be. And we'll get through, we'll get to, we'll get to point number five which will explain to you on uh, how to stop the macadamia nut throwing at the dinner table. But do not yell or hit your kids. Do not show your kids that you're out of control. It's a beautiful thing to be in control. It's strong. It's dominant. It's sexy. It's productive. It's a strength amongst the, the, the biggest strength amongst the strongest people. Number four, no sugar. Do not feed your kids poison. Ever, 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 ever do not feed your kids poison. Do not bring poison into your house. Do not feed your kids sugar. But it happens and you don't want to make a weirdo kid. You don't want to be the kid at the birthday party with a bag of carrots. I get it. So here's what you do. You go to the birthday party and there's soda there, which is a no-go 100% of the time. And there is cake and there is ice cream. You tell your kid you can pick between cake and ice cream. Your kid will probably pick cake, which is a huge mistake. And you let your kid eat that cake, a small piece. You ask him if you can have a piece because you want to eat some of that poison off your kid's plate so your kid doesn't have to eat it. And you actually, maybe you just eat it when they're not looking. And that's it. What you don't do ever is when you go to the local pool where you go three times a week, let your kid ever get ice cream out of the vending machine there. Because then every time you pass that vending machine, you now have a problem. It's like walking a drug addict past the heroin dealer. Don't do it. Don't set your kid up for failure. Say no the first time and let it be done. Say no three more times and your kids will just look at it and wish that they had different parents, but they won't fight you on it. Do not set your kid up for success. Uh, for failure. Do not let them have ice cream at a place where you go every day. The lady, let's say, at your kid's piano lesson always wants to give them cookies. No, not even once. Not even because it's Christmas. Make those places that they get sugar very rare and uh, make it make it sort of like an exclusive type. Exclusive type. Hey, boys. Don't touch the motorcycles. You guys being good? You guys being good? So no sugar. Do the right thing. No sugar. Don't bring sugar home to your kids. Don't feed your kids sugar. That's what being a great parent's about. Number five, follow through. Always follow through. It makes everything in life easier. And what it does is it gives your kids stability. Boundaries. Following through is what creates boundaries. If you tell your kid, hey, you can't watch movies tonight because you spit on your sister, then you can't watch movies tonight. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. I don't care how good he's been later on. Follow through. That ties me back to number three, no, no yelling or hitting. You follow through so your kid has strict boundaries and knows the rules so that you never have to lose your fucking cool. Your kids will say, I see ice cream, but I know I can't have it. And then you're like, yeah, 
I did my job. Be a good parent, follow through. It's not a fucking popularity contest. It's about making a safe place where your kid knows the rules so that they can go ballistic and be safe and be kids. You want them to be allowed to be kids. Not making boundaries for them will make them feel unsafe. It may seem counterintuitive to you, like you're being too strict, but you're not. You're making a super duper duper safe cage, boundary, acreage for them to go nuts in. Bedtime, number six. Always have a bedtime. Bedtime's super duper duper important. It's just more about those boundaries, more about having rules, more about feeling safe. You need to read to your kid every night if you're gonna be a great parent, every night. You need to put them to bed on time. And if you don't put them to bed on time and you don't read them, you're missing an opportunity that you will never, ever, ever, ever get back. Because once they fall asleep at 10 o'clock one night or 11 o'clock one night and you didn't read to them, then you're never getting that day back. And you never know what's gonna stick and when it's gonna stick with kids. And those of you who have kids, you know what I mean. You may do something a thousand times that never sticks with your kid and you do something once, obscure off to the side and your kid sees it and it sticks. Read to your kid every night at bedtime. That may be the greatest gift you can give your kid. You want your kid to have a huge vocabulary. You want your kid to be a wizard with words. Why? Because words control this world. Naming is the origin of all particular things. Be smart. Read to your kid. Let your kid be a magician that controls the world with his words. Those words will stick better if your kid sleeps well and has a great bedtime. Now, yes, maybe Friday and Saturday nights, the bedtime is 10 o'clock. Fine. Stick to it. Make it 10 o'clock. Your kids need bedtime. They need structure. That, this one's really hard for me because I want to keep my kids up till 1 in the morning playing with them. That's all I want to do. Play, play, play every night. Bedtime. Bedtime and reading. Make sure you're reading to your kids. Exercise in front of them. I just did uh, rowing and push-ups. And my kids came in there and every time I got off the rower, they got on the rower. And of course, I want to be like, dude, what are you doing? You're in my way. But I don't. I just gently say, excuse me, my turn. And if they don't get up, I lift them and move them. And yes, they may be slowing me down a little bit, but I'm not fucking Rich Froney. I'm not Matt Fraser. I'm just trying to get fit secondary to my being a good example for my kid. And so I can draw really strict boundaries. They can be in there when I'm working out, but they can't, they, but when it's my turn to get back on the row or when I'm done with my pushups, they got to get out of the way. And next thing you know, I'm working out with them. Three rounds in, they see my, my three-year-old sees that every time I get off the row, it's his turn. And when I'm off the row, when I'm on the rower, he's doing pushups. I didn't, didn't even try to teach him that. I want them to see me sweat. I want them to see me struggle. I want them to see me humble. I want them to see me hurting. I want them to see me pushing through. Let your kids see you work out. Now, if you're juiced up out of your mind, you're doing 400 pound overhead squat and you're fucking buzzed from the night before and you drank some shit that's got more caffeine in it than 12, 12 cans of Coke, do not be working out in front of your kids. I get it, okay? There's exceptions. Don't be stupid. All of this stuff I'm saying, don't be stupid. Talking about doing Cindy in front of your kids. Talking about, I'm talking about, you you can do stuff. You can do cleans and snatches. You have to be super duper aware. And if they step on the platform, you have to be vicious. Off the platform. And that's that. But they get to be in there. My wife still comes in here into the garage every time I'm working out and says, Is it okay if the kids are in there? Absolutely. That's my job as a parent. That's what I'm role modeling. I'm role modeling. That's, that's, that's got to be 51% of the reason I work out for my kids. Present your kids cleanly. Present them with no snot, clean shirt, nice hair, nice pants. Do not present your kids like pieces of shit. When I drop my kid off at school, I am shocked at the number of filthy kids that arrive there. And it's a nice school. Why do you present your kids nicely? Because you want people to love your kids. You want people to think your kids are cute. You want people to think your kids are sweet. You want people to want to interact with your kids. Don't think for a second 
the three teachers in your kid's first grade class or two teachers don't have favorites and don't pick and choose who to work with. They do not want to work with the snotty-nosed kid with the torn shirt and the stain on him. They may have pity for your kid, and what's worse, they may even project that pity onto your kid. You don't want your kid to feel any of that. And would you go to work looking like shit? Would you go to work looking anything but perfect? A car mechanic told me one time, every time you bring your car to me, I was 16, I was a 77 Volkswagen Rabbit. Every time you, and he said in his strong German accent, every time you bring your car to me, make sure it's clean inside and out. And I'm like, why? He's all, because I'll treat it better. And, and, I, and I get it. It's like, I didn't need anything else explained to me. I get it. Please. What I do to make it really easy on me, one outfit. You guys have seen it. Argyle sweaters, capri pants, that's it. Wife beaters underneath in the summer, long sleeve shirts in the winter. Underneath the Argyle sweater, that's it. Clean shoes. I wipe their shoes down almost, wipe their shoes down regularly. If I see any schmutz on them, I have wipes. Every time my kids get out of the car, I wipe their face with a wipe. I wipe their hands with the wipe. I'm not worried about disease or infection or any of that shit. I want them to be clean. I want the world to be like, wow. Those Mitocines are cute, sweet kids. I want to interact with them. Clean your kids. They're yours. I'm not talking about putting bows and stupid shit in their hair, trying to make sure that people know it's a boy or a girl or any of that crap. I'm talking about just a clean presentation. You know what that is? Number nine, be still and don't react. I would say 50% of the times I interact with my kids, I probably shouldn't be. I should be staying quiet. Why is that? Because I don't want to take opportunity away from them. It's their moment. It's their time. You've seen your kid try to jump up to a half-inch little step 20 times and fall every time. And then all of a sudden, you see him try to jump to a two-inch step. And what do you want to do? You want to interfere and say, no, no, don't do that. That's not the time to interfere. Even though you know he can't make a half-inch jump, how's he going to make the two-inch jump? It's still not your place. That's not what parenting's about. Parenting's about while he's doing the two-inch step to make sure some, some guy doesn't get him or he's not doing it in the middle of the street. If you're in Florida, some alligator doesn't get him. Or if you're in Santa Cruz, California, to make sure he doesn't step on a needle. That's what your job is. Other than that, try to keep your mouth shut. Watch your kid. Let your kid be free. Let your kid express himself. You can have those concerns in your head. You can have that fear. But have enough mindfulness and cultivate enough self-awareness that you don't actually act on your fears and project them onto your kids and steal opportunities away from your kids. I'm not saying you should urge, by the way, please don't read into this. I'm not suggesting you, you urge your kid to jump off the, up onto the two-inch step either. Same bullshit. That, that's just chatter in your brain too. You don't have to do anything. You're just there on sentry duty. Is that what it's called, sentry? You just look around. You just take the Tony Blower course and just keep it, keep it, just turn that on, flip that on when you're with your kid. Turn on the Tony Blower course and your CF, CFL1. That's it. Stay as present as you can. That's not going to come easy. That's a, that's just that's practice, 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 practice. It's the same mindfulness you use when you. Well, the reason why you don't you don't stuff something in your face and eat it when you want to. You see that thought and you let it go. Number ten. I only had nine for the longest time, and finally my 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 wife pointed out number ten to me. You are not friends with your kids. Let me rephrase that. Your kid is not your best friend. You can be your kid's best friend. Your kid can come to you with everything. That's your job. When his girlfriend breaks up with him and he's crying, he comes to you. When your daughter doesn't make the cheerleading team and some other girl called her fat, she comes to you. When they snuck out in the middle of the night and they got drunk and they call you at 2 a.m. because they're stuck somewhere, they call you. Yeah, you're there for them. They are not to be there for you. You're not, they're not to hear you wake up in the morning and say, does this outfit look bad, make me look fat or look bad on me? You're not there. That's what your spouse is for. If 
you're divorced or whatever, or single, you don't have a spouse, then suck it up. You're, that's just one more obstacle or hurdle for you to deal with. But they are not your friend. Don't burden them with any of that stuff. Not until they're 50. So like I'm 48 and I don't even want to hear any of my parents shit for another two years. You hear that, mom? Dad? Your kid is not your friend. You are a parent. You are a role model. You're a paragon of strength. That doesn't mean that you can't show weakness. That doesn't mean you can't cry. That doesn't mean you can't have feelings. That means just don't let them see stupid insecurities. You know if you look fat. They don't want to hear... My kids don't want to hear that any complaints I have about their mom. They don't want to hear any complaints from my wife that my wife has about me. Don't put any of that on your kid. A kid is not your friend. So those are the 10 things. You got it. Now granted... This is a guy who only has been a parent for five years. So, I mean, I'd say 98% of what I said you should vet with someone who's been a parent for longer. But these these, these are what you see me implementing. This is why I'm getting what I'm getting out of my kid.